<clears throat> All right. Uh, okay, so we'll. Uh, I think we'll start. Uh, last time we were doing this problem. Uh, we did not get the time to complete it. So we'll start from this problem and then we'll uh, proceed further, right? Uh, before I get to that anyway, uh, is there any question from the topics that we were talking about before? Where we discussed potential energy, kinetic energies, uh, and the total energy of an oscillator. Uh, we also... Uh, the velocity and displacement relation. Uh, anyone? Uh, Alicia or Anna? I cannot hear you for some reason. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, all right. So, you got this relation? Uh, v uh, versus yeah. displacement. Right. Okay. Okay, good. So uh, this is uh, the relation that we derived. We use this velocity to uh, write down the kinetic energy of uh, any oscillatory motion. Uh, we saw that the maximum kinetic energy of such type of um, motion depends on the extreme uh, position of the oscillation, which is X naught. That is also the amplitude of the oscillation. And uh, from there we use uh, the definition for the elastic potential energy to write down the potential energy of a uh, her, of any simple harmonic oscillator, and uh, which was this, and then we found that the total energy, which is the sum of the kinetic and potential energy of the system, just turns out to be the e equal to the maximum kinetic energy or the maximum potential energy. Uh, can you take a guess why? Uh, this thing, uh, why the, the total energy of such an oscillator is always equal to, to a maximum? Because uh, if you see uh, the maximum potential energy from this expression is also half m omega squared. And when would be the potential energy minimum? When it would be uh, when the oscillator or the pendulum would it would be at its maximum displacement from the mean position, right? That's when it would have uh, it stored maximum amount of potential energy. So that position is x naught. So I'll replace this x squared with x naught squared. We see that this thing is also equal to, this is the maximum potential energy, which is equal to the maximum kinetic energy, right? Which is equal to the total energy of the, oscillate. Uh, how is that possible? Can anyone take a guess? Why is that so? It's not surprising at all. Uh, it should have been like this. We should be expecting this result. Uh, can anyone tell me why? Uh, I'll give you a hint. Uh, think about the conservation law of energy. Um, who was the question again? Uh, the question is uh, that uh, we see that the maximum potential energy would be half m omega squared. And in place of this x squared, I'll put x naught squared, right? Because uh, the oscillator would have its potential energy maximum when it's at a maximum height that it can possibly be, right? Or maximum displacement that it can have. That's uh, potential energy, right? So. And we also derived that the maximum kinetic energy is also equal to half m omega squared x naught squared. And then when I wrote down this total energy by adding those two, we saw that the total energy of the system is also half m omega squared x naught squared. How can the total energy of a system be e exactly equal to the maximum kinetic energy or the maximum potential energy of such a system. The key word here, I'll give you hints. The key word is maximum. Uh, and the second is hint is that think in terms of uh, conservation of energy. Can you uh, um, 
Yes. And that's because when the potential energy is at its maximum, the kinetic energy is zero. And when the kinetic energy is at its maximum, the potential energy is zero. So at the end of the day, we have the same total kinetic. Uh, totally. Exactly right. So so yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's the answer that I was looking for. Uh, so uh, all right. So uh, who gave me that answer? Uh, was it Alicia or Anna? Uh, Alicia. Alicia. Right. So uh, Anna, do you understand uh, this as well? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Okay. Perfect. So so that's uh, the reason because and. The reason for this is again the conservation uh, of energy. To conserve energy, this has to be true. All right. Okay. So that's what we covered so far, and we were doing a, a problem. I'll just quickly restate the problem. The problem was that you have a pendulum, and uh, the time period of such a pendulum is two seconds, where the mass of this pendulum, the bob that is attached to the string, uh, is 200 grams, right? Uh, so actually let's make it 600 and uh, then suppose that I raise this pendulum to any height and then release it. The height that I raise it to or the displacement actually that I give it would be the amplitude of the oscillation and that's 5.2 centimeters. So that's the value of X naught. Now, you want to find out the kinetic or the maximum kinetic energy of this pendulum, uh, meaning you will have to find out the maximum speed of this pendulum, right? So to find out the maximum speed of the pendulum, uh, where would the speed be maximum? That's the first thing that you have to know. Uh, in this entire course of its oscillatory motion, at what point in this motion would the speed uh, be maximum? Anyone? The speed is maximum when it's in the middle point. And at the middle point, right? At the center, because uh, at this point, uh, it would it will be having the maximum uh, velocity because uh, at this point, the gravitational potential energy is minimum, means that the kinetic energy is maximum. Uh, hence the velocity at this point should be the highest, right? So then if I use uh, this expression for uh, the kinetic energy, which is what? Uh, half, let's, uh, at this point, I'm not talking about maximum kinetic energy or anything. We're talking generally uh, about the kinetic energy of the oscillator. Uh, that would be half m omega squared x naught squared minus x squared, right? Uh, so now we want the point that is at this middle, that is at the center or the mean position. So x would be zero at mean position, right? And then we uh, go back to the expression for uh, the maximum kinetic energy, which is uh, this one that we wrote over here. Now, uh, I was telling you last time that if you re remember from a circular motion, uh, we talked about uh, how can I relate the tangential velocity component with the angular uh, velocity of a, of a motion, right? And that relation was with this thing, V is equal to R times omega. R was simply, if we're talking about a circular motion, then R is the radius of that oscillation, uh, of that object that is oscillating in a circle. Uh, of course, uh, in any general case, uh, X, it would be X naught or, or just any X, right? Uh, not any X, uh, it should be the amplitude, the maximum displacement, right? Uh, if you remember the example for a circle, it was something like this. Uh, I have this radius. So this is the maximum distance that this uh, bob is away from the center of the circle and moving in this direction, right? So then we have this relation. This uh, relates V, the tangential velocity with the angular velocity. And of course, uh, in kinetic energy, we have half m V squared, right? So if I want to calculate the maximum velocity, then I need this maximum velocity, right? So I can 
well, I can reduce uh, or write this expression, kinetic energy, as half mv squared, right? And this v is the tangential velocity of the oscillation. So to find out this velocity, all I need to do is uh, rearrange this expression as two times the kinetic energy. Uh, now, we want the maximum velocity. So we should have the maximum kinetic energy. And uh, what is the rest? Uh, we'll divide this by the mass, right? And then square root this thing. So I just rearranged this expression into this one. Now, we are given the time period. The time period of the oscillation is two seconds, right? So then finding out this value for omega is very simple. You just have to uh, remember that omega was two pi divided by t or just two pi f, right? But f is one by t. F is the frequency of the oscillation. So just put, put in the values and you would get omega as two pi by two is just pi radians. So any question at, uh, so far? No, sir. All right. No. So, okay. So now uh, we can easily find the maximum kinetic energy, right? So the maximum kinetic energy, which was half m omega squared x naught squared. I have omega now. Uh, I have x naught, the amplitude of the oscillation. We have the mass. So just put in these values. Mass was 600 grams, so that would be 0 0.6 kilograms. Omega is pi radians. We'll square this thing and then multiply this with uh, the amplitude of the oscillation, which was 5.2 centimeters, right? If you, uh, it was given in the problem. So just write it as uh, 5.2 into 10 raised to power minus two meters, right? And now which all you have to do is just do the math, right? And uh, this would give you uh, the maximum kinetic energy as eight point something, uh, 8.0 into 10 raised to power minus three joules, right? So now the first part of the question is completed which was to find the maximum kinetic energy. And now it's very simple to find the maximum velocity because the maximum velocity is, or we derived this relation before this one, right? So this relation, uh, the reason that I was deriving this was to compute the second part. And so the maximum velocity is just square root of two times this kinetic energy, which is this thing divided by the mass, uh, which was 600 grams, so 0 0.6 kilograms. And then you just do the math, and this gives you 0 0.16 meters per second. So is, the, is it clear? This is the velocity. This is the maximum velocity with which the pendulum would oscillate at its mean position. So if I release this pendulum, it's going to start oscillating like this, and then it's going to come back. When it comes back, it's crossing this mean position. At that point, its velocity would be a maximum of 0 0.16 meters per second. So is there any uh, problem in this question? Is no, that okay? Sir. No problems? All right. Okay, so if that's clear, then uh, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, we, are, we have only two topics left, resonance, right? And then we'll talk about damping. So first, I guess let's talk about resonance. Now, all right. So, you know, you can, uh, is everybody familiar with the idea of we can use sound waves to break a glass, right? Sound can be used to break a glass. Uh, is it, is everyone familiar with the fact? 
Yeah. Right. So it's because we have these. Uh, you get enough energy from the sound waves uh, that are that can overcome the energy required to separate uh, the the you know the you can say the atoms or the molecules that have made up the glass. And so how how why is that? How is that uh, possible? If you think in terms of uh, these waves, uh, you know that. It doesn't matter, but everything that, that you get, you see, uh, it's made up of atoms, right? Everything is made up of atoms, whether it's a glass, whether it's a plastic or whatever it is, it's made up of atoms. Uh, atoms are never sitting still. They're always vibrating. It doesn't matter if it's a solid, it's a liquid, uh, it's crystal clear that in a gas, the atoms are not moving at all. I'm sure that uh, by this time, you're all familiar with the fact. Uh, but even in a solid, the atoms are not sitting still. They are moving, they are jiggling around uh, in their uh, structure. So because of that fact, if they're moving, they're essentially vibrating and they have some frequency with which they oscillate, with which they're vibrating, right? And this frequency is called the natural frequency. I'll just call it omega n, right? Sometimes you call it omega naught or uh, you can give it any name, but uh, this is known as the natural frequency of, uh, the, of any object, right? Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that this, is the maximum frequency that the object can bear to stay in the structure that it is in, right? If I give it any more frequency, if I somehow supply it enough more energy, right? Then what would happen is that that frequency would overcome this natural frequency and then that would change the structure of the object. So by changing the structure, I mean, if it's a glass, it could break, right? And that's why the glass breaks because what you're doing is you're, uh, you're giving it enough uh, amount of vibrations with such a higher amplitude that uh, the frequency that you're providing it uh, becomes either equal or greater than the natural frequency of the oscillation. And so then the structure changes. Uh, this is the reason that, uh, you, you know, some of the buildings may collapse. Uh, bridges might also collapse if there is a heavy machinery uh, over there, if there is, uh, or even in the constructions of building, if there's a, a machinery that's uh, so heavy or, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's vibrating. It's also, uh, it's vibrating so uh, heavily that its frequency it's greater than the natural frequency of the uh, building. Then the building would collapse, right? So, uh, is the idea of natural frequency clear? That it's uh, a frequency that every system will have. Every system has a frequency, right? Uh, that uh, is its own frequency, right? And this frequency is uh, dependent on, uh, obviously on the material that the, uh, that the uh, object is made up of, uh, on the size of the object, on how heavy the object is and how the atoms are arranged, right? In any specific material, how the atoms are arranged. Uh, different arrangement of atoms uh, correspond to different materials, right? And so this, uh, in an engineering language, it's called the design of the uh, material or the object, right? So it could be the design of the building. And so, that's a frequency that every system is going to have. Any frequency that is greater or equal to this frequency is critical for the system. It might, uh, it can cause 
uh, the collapse of the system entirely, right? So uh, then the, the, the frequency that I provide the system is also called the driving frequency. So this is the frequency that I'm providing the system, which can be higher than the natural frequency. So for example, if a system is sitting still, right? Any object is sitting still. Suppose uh, this is a block and this block is going to have its own natural frequency with which the block is, the atoms, the block is made up of and those atoms are vibrating in their, uh, you know, doing their own thing. Uh, and then all of a sudden I come and I push the block, kick the block or whatever. What I'm doing to the block is I'm giving it some driving frequency, right? Uh, and that frequency, uh, I'll just call it omega. If I give this that, uh, when I kick it or uh, push it or apply any sort of force uh, to this object, uh, then what I'm doing is I'm just giving it some more frequency. Now, if this frequency omega is greater than or equal to omega natural, which is the natural frequency, then uh, resonance happens. Right, so driving frequency is nothing but uh, the external uh, frequency, right? That I might provide uh, to the system apart from its own natural frequency. So that means uh, if I if the uh, if the external frequency is greater than the system's natural frequency then you're going to cause uh, all types of disasters, collapse of buildings, bridges. Uh, you, you may even, uh, you know, so for example, if there, if there is some machinery that's operating and the, the machine operates, when, when a machine is operating, you know, you're familiar with the fact that it's vibrating as well. And if the, if the vibrations are so large compared to the natural frequency of the machine, then the machine might break as well. Right. So these are some of the things that you have to uh, keep in consideration uh, when even designing systems. Uh, so this external frequency is related to uh, types of oscillations that are called forced oscillations. Right. Because obviously, uh, if you think about this, uh, this example that I gave that you have a block and you kick the block, you're forcing some oscillations in the block. Initially, it was not oscillating. It was just sitting. It was oscillating with its natural frequency, but I forced some oscillations on it by kicking the block. And hence, uh, these type of oscillations are called forced oscillations. And then you can solve the differential equation that I wrote uh, last time. If you remember, it was M d square x by dt squared uh, is equal to, it was minus kx. If you remember this equation, right? We wrote this down uh, when we started this topic, uh, this chapter. And now the forced oscillation, uh, there is some external force, right? So I'll just add that external force in this differential equation. Now this capital F is the force that I might have kicked the block with. And uh, you know that those kind of forced uh, external forces. Now, if I can solve, now if I solve this differential equation, I'll get a different solution. Remember, last time we got x is equal to x naught uh, sine omega t. Now the solution will not be the same. This would not be the solution. Uh, the solution would be different, and that solution would also account for uh, this force F, right? So of course, now solving uh, this differential equation is a bit more complicated. Uh, it's, uh, it's in fact, sometimes also called an inhomogeneous differential equation. And so that's not the part of the course. So we'll, we'll leave uh, this thing uh, just to that. Uh, I'll just show you a graph between uh, the frequency and the amplitude of the oscillations, right? Uh, for a resonance case. So if I have frequency over here and suppose I have any amplitude X naught over here, uh, 
uh, any x, right? So the graph looks like a sharp peak, right? And the amplitude is maximum when the frequency is equal to the natural frequency, right? That's when the amplitude is maximum and that's when all the disasters can happen, right? Collapse of buildings and so on that talked about, right? So this type of a graph is known as a sharp uh, peak curve. And for all the resonance, you will uh, observe this, uh, the, 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 the graphical representation as a sharp peak curve. So that's a resonance. Uh, is that clear for everyone? Any questions from the topic of resonance? No, sir. All right, amazing. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, it just occurred to me uh, all of a sudden, uh, Alicia, I just remember that uh, yesterday you shared your email address for, uh, the, uh, if I, to, for me to share the recordings of the lectures, right? Uh, I forgot. Uh, can you please remind me after the class again? So immediately I'll uh, do this after the class, right? So just uh, remind me after the class is over, just a text in the group or so on to remind me. Okay, so after uh, this thing, now we can talk about damping. I hope we have uh, enough time. You have seven minutes, all right. Okay, so now let's finish this chapter with the topic of damping. Uh, all right, so damping is something that is uh, you'll always practically observe in your oscillation so far we have been talking about uh, graphs that looked uh, like this let me just draw so our graphs followed the sine or cosine functions and they looked something like this right so they were their peaks were always at the same height right so it's like this they're always at the same Height. Now, this type of uh, oscillations are not practical. Uh, at practical as in you would not observe these type of oscillations on a daily basis. The type of oscillations that you will observe are, uh, they look something like this. So let me uh, try to draw it. So you have this curve, then you have this, and then now it starts to decrease, right? And something like this. So you can clearly see uh, this thing that if I draw a line like this, you can see that the uh, these uh, peaks are decreasing. They're uh, going downwards. Uh, why? Why do you think that it sh should? This should be uh, a more realistic case compared to. Uh, the first one. Uh, can you think of any reason why should the second case be a more realistic case? Uh, okay, so basically, uh, when anything is oscillating, for example, I'll again start with the example of this pendulum. If this pendulum is oscillating, then what is happening? The pendulum is suspended in a room, right? And of course, in a room, there are going to be uh, particles, air particles, right? For example, there could be air particles. That's the most simplest case. And the this pendulum, this bob, is going to collide with these molecules of air, right? As, as it's oscillating, these air molecules are going to come into its path and it's going to collide with these air molecules. And when it does that, what it's doing is, it's transferring its energy into these molecules. And at the end, what's left is this bob with less and less and less amount of energy, right? So it's losing its energy into the environment. And that loss of energy would mean that its amplitude of the oscillation would start decreasing, decreasing, and decreasing. And that's the reason that when you oscillate a pendulum uh, in, in, in a simple room, 
then you will observe that the pendulum eventually comes to a stop at its mean position. Otherwise, if you were doing it in a vacuum, for example, in a perfect vacuum, uh, the pendulum will go on forever. It will never stop because there is nothing that the pendulum can collide with and transfer its energy to. So the pendulum, the bob has to lose its energy to the environment uh, to eventually come to a stop. And what that means for the uh, amplitude of the oscillations is that that would decrease the amplitude of our vibrations. And so we can see that the amplitude here is higher compared to the amplitude here, and then that's higher compared to here, and then that's higher compared to here. But as we move further and further, the amplitude keeps on decreasing and eventually it will decrease to zero. So is that clear? Is, it, uh, is, the, is this uh, up until this point damping is clear? Yes, sir. All right. So now to damp, to cause damping, you can, uh, you can cause damping by several means, right? Uh, you can cause uh, damping by hitting, performing your oscillations uh, in, in some type of a fluid. For example, maybe if I oscillate uh, in water compared to air, the oscillations would damp very quickly in uh, water because uh, now, it's easier for the uh, bob to collide with molecules of water because the molecules of water are even more closely packed together, right? Compared to the molecules of air, which is just a gas and the molecules are uh, roaming around here and there. But for, uh, for a liquid, the molecules are even closely packed. So it would be easier to distribute the bob's energy into these molecules. If in turn I use, instead of water, I use oil, then it would be even more harder for the bob to oscillate for, uh, for a long time. It would die out even quickly, right? Because in, uh, in, a, in oil, the density is high. And it's high meaning that there is more oil packed in the same amount of volume compared to water. So there are more number of molecules that are packed in the same amount of volume as water. So then it would be even harder, even easier to distribute the energy of the bob into these molecules. So this takes us to the types of damping. And there are three main types of damping, right? Uh, the first one is a light damping. And for a light damping, uh, the graph looks exactly like the one that I drew. Then there is uh, something that is called critical damping. In critical damping, uh, the vibrations are going to die out very quickly. So for example, oil could be an example, right? And the graph would look something uh, like, you know, uh, it would, they would die out very quickly, right? at this point, now they're just dead, right? So they're zero. Now there is no more oscillation further from this point. Uh, then there is uh, the third one, which is called uh, you know, heavy damping. In heavy damping, the oscillations die out, right? They die out 